Hello and welcome back to DC to Daylight. My name is Derek, and in the last video we took a brief look at Maxwell's equations and talked about how radio waves propagate through space. In this episode we'll perform a demonstration on the bench which shows RF polarization and the inverse square law. We'll also continue our discussion with our RF expert, Sterling Mann, and we'll do some antenna modeling with a program called MMANAGAL. This will all set us up for our application video coming up in a few weeks, where we'll use this knowledge to build a much larger antenna and point it around the globe and try to make contact with other folks via an amateur radio transceiver. So let's get into part two of this series on antenna basics. All right, so on to the demonstration. So we've got our power supply here that we worked on, if you remember the Zener regulator, 25 amp linear power supply. And we have our VHF UHF radio here we're going to use for this to energize this antenna. And we have an amplifier that's going to put me at about 50 watts. And I've already done the, before anybody says anything, I've already done the uh, calculations on an RF exposure limit. We're only going to do this for a couple minutes. And as long as I'm at least a foot away, I should be okay. So when I'm in Florida, I'm next to Kennedy Space Center and I'm next to an Air Force Base. So some of these frequencies are used for flight termination systems. So I have to be very careful about the power output that I use and that I'm within regulations and I am. So here we go. Whiskey 4 Victor X-Ray Hotel, uh, testing 50 watt peak envelope power per FCC part 97.313. So as I bring this antenna closer to the source, you can see it lights up, all right? Now, as long as those E fields and the B fields are in the same plane, this guy will light up. I know it's kind of hard to see. So as I bring this light closer and closer in, you can see it light up, okay? Now, as I turn this perpendicular to the antenna, those E fields are not lined up, the B fields are not lined up, and the light completely goes out, all right? If I'm a certain distance away from this antenna, okay, um, I have a certain intensity. If I double that distance, that intensity decreases exponentially, okay? That is the inverse square law, inverse square of the distance. And if I move another one of those distance units away, it decreases even more. Okay, so that is something about antennas that I just find fascinating. This exponential decrease in uh, inverse square law, you know, like I said, is in lights, it's in radio waves, because they're both electromagnetics. You see it in radiation, gravity, all kinds of different things in physics. So it's pretty cool to see it actually occur right here. All right, so up to this point, we haven't talked about how to actually calculate the length of a dipole. But if we take 468 divided by the frequency in megahertz, that tells us the dipole length in feet. If we want to know what it is in meters, we can take 143 and divide that by the frequency in megahertz, okay? Now, I'm not going to go through the math proof of this. Believe me, there is one behind it. Um, but in general, this is the quickest way to calculate the length of a dipole. So I'm going to choose a frequency of 432.1 megahertz because that is the FM calling frequency for the 70 centimeter band. And uh, that's where we're going to test today. So let's hit calculate length. I'm going to scroll down and it tells me the length of each element of our antenna is going to be 6.5 inches. The overall length with both of those elements is 1 foot and 1 inch, okay, or 0.17 meters per element and 0.33 meters total, okay, so that's a total length. Now this is for a wire antenna and I'm using um, some pipe and I have metal objects in the vicinity so it changed the tuning of my antenna, okay, ideally there should be nothing around your antenna, all right. In my case I had to actually cut about an inch off. Without special tools or measurement equipment, how do I know how my antenna is performing? Uh, there are a number of programs out there that we can use to simulate, but I'm going to show you one that's free. I'll put a link down in the description. It's MMANA-GAL Basic. Okay, this is the free version of this program, and it allows you to put your antenna elements in 3D space and check the impedance and see how it's performing, and you can put multiple elements in here and direct the RF energy in a certain place. And it's just a really cool program that shows you how to design antennas and how they're performing in theory. So let's put our antenna in here. I'm going to create a vertical dipole here in 3D space by going to Edit, Wire Edit. And I'm going to look at it in XZ because uh, it's going to be a vertical antenna in the Z plane. Now I'm going to zoom in really close because the 70 centimeter band is a small antenna. I'm going to create a random length. And then I'm going to right click and say wire definition. And we're going to change the length of this. We said overall was 0.33 meters. Okay. You can see it shrunk a little bit. Now we could have drawn two wires, but I drew one and we're going to feed it with our feed point right in the center. To give it our feed point, we're going to say wire one, the feed point of center. All right. Now from there, we have everything that we need. Let's go back to view and you can see that feed points, that little red dot here. We're going to go over to calculate and then we're going to give it the frequency we're going to operate. 432.1 megahertz, which is the FM uh, calling frequency. And we're going to put it in free space, all right? So that's way out away from the earth and nothing that's going to reflect that RF back to the antenna. And we're going to say that it's copper pipe. 
and then we're going to hit start. So you can see our impedance, that's the resistive component, is 73 ohms. That's the typical impedance of the dipole in free space. And we have a reactive component of 1.77. All right, so that means it's just slightly long. If it were negative, it would be slightly capacitive and slightly short. Our SWR value here tells us how much energy is getting reflected back from the antenna given how much energy we put into it. Okay, so 1.46 is okay. If it was just a solid one, it would be perfect, but that never occurs in nature. All right, so we know what our impedance is going to be. Uh, we can go to our far field plot. For a dipole like this in free space, uh, it's common to have this kind of radiation pattern. This tells us where the RF is going. So looking straight down on the antenna on the left here, we can see that the RF is being projected equally in all directions. If we change our vantage point on the right hand side here, it's kind of, it's looking sideways at the broad side to the antenna. We can see we've got no RF going straight up and we can see the RF is being projected at the uh, maximum straight across here in the X plane. So we can actually plot this in 3D. If I hit this 3D far field plot button down here and I hit OK down here, it shows us where the intensity of that RF is in 3D space. So you can see we have our null along the Z axis and all the energy is being projected out in equal directions, okay, in the X and Y plane. Pretty cool. So what happens if we bring this down to Earth? Let's go to the Calculate tab and any dipole wants to be about a half a wavelength above the ground. So instead of free space, I'm going to put this above real ground. I'm going to add a height of 0.33 meters, right? That's half a wavelength. And then we'll recalculate. Just by changing the height above ground, our impedance changed slightly. So we're about 68 ohms resistive and closer to zero as far as the reactive component is concerned. Our SWR actually decreased a little bit, which is good. Now let's go to our far field plot and this shows us again, where the RF is being projected. So on the left-hand side, we're looking straight down. We can see that we're still projecting that energy equally in all directions. However, if we go to look at the antenna from the radiation pattern from the side, we don't have that hemispherical um, donut pattern anymore. It's, it's kind of like a butterfly now. So a lot of that energy is projecting out about 13 degrees above the horizon. Okay, x-axis is our horizon, all right? And a, a lot of that energy is also being projected almost straight up though, about 62 to 50 something degrees, okay? What does it look like in 3D? And you can see that none of that energy is going underground, okay, our x-plane it's all getting reflected up to some degree, okay? We have a nice shallow uh, angle here for long-range communications, but a lot of the energy is going pretty high up. It's getting wasted, all right? So this is the kind of stuff that you can look at in these 3D modeling programs, and there are a number of them out there. MMANA GAL is a good program that's free and does some pretty serious computation to help you see what's happening with your antenna performance. So these parameters that we looked at here, the impedance, um, which tells us if our antenna is resonant at the correct length and how much energy is getting reflected back to the transmitter. These are all important criteria for the transmit side of things. Is it really that important for the receive side of things, however, or just a receiver in general? Do we need to match these parameters? This is another thing that I wanted to take this opportunity to ask Sterling about. So let's see what he has to say. Yeah. So that kind of uh, sums up the transmit side of things. Now to any transceiver, there's also the receive side. So what is going on at, I guess, the antenna uh, transmission line interface there? And is every antenna the same? Does one antenna uh, react more to the E field or the magnetic field? How does that play out? Is it uh, just induction? Yeah, no, it's it, there's a lot of things that go on. So you're right. Um, some antennas are more attuned to the E field than the B field. So a good example is um, wire antennas like dipoles, vertical monopoles. Um, those are commonly referred to or sometimes and maybe even erroneously referred to as electric field antennas. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's not always the okay. case. There's still a magnetic field to be received, um, but they do have some higher, you know, um, component of the E field or the E field is more of a impact or an influence on them than a magnetic field. And then the loop antennas, so like especially like electrically small loops or like, um, you know, when, ones you have for your AM radio, for example. Sure. I don't know if any, no one uses AM radio anymore, but it used to be, and it still is, that inside of an AM radio is a ferrite bar with a, you know, piece of a wire strung around it a whole bunch of times that makes an antenna resonant at those very low frequencies for sure. AM radio. Um, those have tend to have more of a magnetic component. I would try to avoid that kind of distinction that that's an E field antenna and that's a B field antenna because 
All antennas receive electromagnetic waves. All electromagnetic waves are a component of an electro and a magnetic field. So uh, you kind of right, can't, can't have, have one, one without, the, without other. the other. Yeah. There you go. Perfect. Okay, that makes sense. When that electromagnetic wave, let's say we have a predominantly magnetic antenna, we're actually inducing a current in that, we'll say the front end is a tuned circuit or something, right? Mm -hmm. Is that what's going on? And we're basically detecting that? Right. So when you transmit, an antenna has charges moving back and forth. That's what creates the you know EM field. The same exact thing, thing happens in reverse for a receiver or a receiving antenna. Um, that antenna picks up those charges and they're very, very small because, you know, um, as, as you propagate the, the strength of the field decreases by the inverse square law. And you say, like, if you look at a really good equation, like the radar equation or the freeze free, uh, uh the free space transmission loss or path loss equation basically is like four pi something, you know, over the distance squared, a like one watt signal emitted out of a cell phone or something, um, five miles away ends up being like minus 150 or 100 and uh, maybe like minus 90, minus 80 dBm, which comes out to being like femtowatts, picowatts, right. super, super tiny powers. But that is enough for the charges in an antenna far away to pick up, especially if it's a tuned antenna, tuned, you know, the antenna is part of the circuit. So, it, you know, the antenna is a tuned thing uh, it can pick up that tiny charge and receivers in a radio are just un infinitesimally able like to detect those tiny vibrations tiny accelerations of charge in in the you know in the far field so you have like receivers that are that have sensitivity that's the you know the technical term for um how much signal does it need to actually pick up in the order of like minus 120 and 110 dBm decibels relative to a milliwatt, which right. comes out to be, you know, those pico, femto, watts, et cetera. So a transmit antenna typically needs to be, uh, it needs to match the impedance of the transmission line. So we have our um, a reactive component, which could be inductive or capacitive. We have our resistive component to that. Ideally, we want it to match exactly, never does. It's mm -hmm. usually some percent uh, off, but does the receive antenna uh, also need to be resonant? Not necessarily. Um, you can put a paperclip in a, any TV and it'll probably pick up your local TV stations, but a paperclip is nowhere near, like just a paperclip is nowhere near the feed point impedance of not only the um, the transmission line that 70, so TVs and cable TV is typically like 75 ohms instead of 50 ohms. Right. Um, but also it's nowhere near the correct length. So I think TV nowadays is in the 600 megahertz range. Um, because of the digital TV, you know, repacking and all that stuff. Right. So you need a little bit longer than just a, you know, maybe a paperclip is actually the right length, but um, it still picks up because the because receivers are so sensitive, it can still pick up the signal even though it's not perfectly efficient. Ideally, yeah, um, you want your receive antenna to be that 50 ohm as close to that 50 ohm matches as you can get, or to 75 ohms or whatever your receiver is. And at that point, the um, signal coming in is much more adequately received, much more converted into that, you know, feed line signal instead of being wasted as heat. But okay. yeah, because receivers are so sensitive and because the margins that like the, we call it fade margins or link margins are so high, typically in like a, in a radio system, you can have a really compromised antenna and ham radio is really famous for compromised antennas because a lot of hams, especially in Japan, where um, it used to be far more popular. And I think now um, uh, there's more American hams than Japanese hams, but um, Japan, Japan is known for very cramped quarters, very, you know, everyone lives in a small apartment, tiny, um, they have a tiny uh, balcony, even if they if they even have one. So you have to stick antennas in your attic or in your closet or just in your room somewhere. And that'll still pick up signals across the world, um, you know, on voice, on Morse code, on the new digital modes, etc. cetera. Um, even though it's compromised, even though it's, you know, trying to connect and, and your, your house wiring is in the near field. Um, just because our receivers are so sensitive. So where can people see you in social media? You're on YouTube, obviously. Yeah, I'm I'm all over. I think in the last couple of months, I've been like kind of taking a, a break from the World Wide Web, but I'm everywhere. If you look up N0SSE, my website, N0SSE.com is kind of where I 
have a bunch of contact info. You can find all my writings there. I used to do writings for the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL for um, youth engagement. Um, I do want to shout out Youth on the Air. Um, that's Great. one of the things that I, I've been working on for, for a long time. This is one of their QSL cards from last uh, last year's camp. We do ham radio camps for young people ages 15 through 24, 5, 6-ish. Um, so uh, I think apl- applications for this year are closed, but there's there's a lot of resources for youngsters and young people who want to get their ham radio license or do have one and want to know like what do you what can you actually do with it. That's uh, youthontheair.org. Okay. Um, and besides that, the standard places, Twitter, I'm on Mastodon now. So, um, and the YouTube channel, which I haven't updated in a long time. Um, but I do have a TikTok, so there's that. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of everything. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you again. For, we really appreciate you coming on and, uh, you know, educating us. So Yeah. Thank you, Derek. It's It's been a pleasure. I, I really love to talk about, you know, radio as much as I possibly can. So I appreciate that a lot. All right. That's it for this episode of DC to Daylight. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and I hope you learned something and uh, the antennas interested you. I know that I learned uh, quite a bit about the, the field of propagation. Uh, from Sterling, so I appreciate him coming on and talking to us about that, okay? And let me know if you make your own antennas or if this inspired you maybe to get your amateur radio license and try it out. I would love to hear about it. Let me know down in the comments or you can hit the link down in the description and interact with me directly in the community. We can share pictures, videos, links, things that you've worked on and um, your own antennas that you've built. I'd love to see that for sure. Okay, so that's it for me and we'll see you next time.